How's it going and welcome to No Fun Allowed's guide series on the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, a 5th edition module. In today's video we'll be going over Thither's named locations. So there is a lot of good stuff going on here, but before we get into that, players do not watch this as there will be spoilers, but DMs don't want that added insight, go and stick around because we have a lot to cover here. So here it is, the foresty goodness that is Thither. In the previous video we went over the general overview as well as the random encounters, so let's dive into the named locations. We have Nibs Cave, we have the Wayward Pool, we have Loom Lurch, and we have Little Oak. So, topographically, we can see here that these things line up, you know, up to down. But interesting enough, it does state that you should go to Nibs Cave first, and then skip past the Wayward Pool, skip past Loom Lurch, then go all the way to Little Oak, and then from Little Oak, then you go all the way back to the Wayward Pool, and then you finally go to Loom Lurch. You know... Topographically, this adventure doesn't make any sense at all, but once again, just play into that fun aspect. Play into the fact that maybe the map isn't accurate, or play into the fact that maybe the map is accurate and your players have to travel every which way, but make the travel fun and make it feel unique because, you know, it's a little odd, it's a little strange, but we're going to work with it. For our first location, we have Nibs Cave. When your players arrive to the land of Thither, this is presumably the first location that they go to. As mentioned before, it doesn't need to be the first location, but this certainly does go an extremely long way because they can get some really good swag. When your players arrive, they're going to interact with Nib. They will see this unarmed human who is toiling away, knitting a whole bunch of stuff. So, what is a Nib? A Nib is a copper piece from the city of Waterdeep. So, you could think of this person as being a penny pincher or a miser, and that is the reason that this person is in this predicament, because he led a cruel and heartless existence, and he exploited his tenants' miseries to get all these riches, and now he is cursed, and unfortunately for him, is having a terrible time. So, what I would strongly recommend is, your players, when they arrive here, either they had already been told that Nib is willing to give out some goodies, or whatever guy that they have with them, presumably Clapperclaw, will say, Hey, I know someone that can help you. And that way, your players can show up and say, Hey, can we get something cool? So, the cool thing here is that Nib is going to spin an item for the characters and give them a cool item. And hopefully your players do reciprocate the kindness here and they give Nib something in return because Nib is probably feeling a little bit lonely in this cave because he's always haunted by a ghost and stuff. So with the eight gifts we have here, we have some pretty strong items. The amulet of proof of detection and location, the bag of holding, boots of Elenkind, etc, etc. These things are really cool. And you can definitely have it where your players get one of these cool rewards and you make them roll the d8 and you can play into the whole threes and eights thing. But one, re-roll anything because giving out two of one thing is kind of boring and it just wouldn't make any sense really. But also important is, is it only the player characters that get these items? Because at this point in the adventure, your players could have several named NPCs alongside them. They could have Clapperclaw, and they could have Morgort who's guiding them, and they could have any number of NPCs that are joining them along the way. So is Nib going to give an item out to all of them? To that, I think that is entirely left up to you. Are the NPCs just the people that sit in the back and don't do anything at all? Or are the NPCs in your game very active and are just as active as the PCs? Not DM PCs, mind you, but, you know, just active NPCs. If they are very active, then for sure, let them roll on it, and maybe they can give these items to the rest of the characters. But if they're pretty passive, then maybe they have no need, or maybe they've gotten some item from Nib a long time ago. Now, through talking to Nib and observing this location, your players will observe that Nib is being haunted. So, the thing is, is this should hopefully steer anybody away from trying to steal any amount of gold, because there is this humongous pile of gold, and... As of right this moment in the adventure, gold is completely worthless because gold is worthless in the land of Prismere. But the thing is, is that some people might say, hey, maybe we can take all this gold and bring it back, you know, to the world. If they do that, they're cursed. And if they are cursed in this way, then they are going to be in for a terrible time. And why is that a terrible time? Because any character who steals gold from Niv's cave is haunted by 1d4 apparitions. As a consequence of these hauntings, the character gains one level of exhaustion after finishing a long rest. Now that's a big deal because that is just straight up, you're going to have one level of exhaustion. Levels of exhaustion gained from this can only be removed if the character removes the haunting. 
So if you only read that first sentence, it would only imply that you have a permanent plus one exhaustion, which is pretty bad disadvantage on ability checks, but it's not the worst thing around. But more importantly is the fact that you are gaining exhaustion and you cannot get rid of it with long rest. And that means that you are going to die. If you take any of this gold in six days, you are going to die. A wish spell can end this curse and a remove curse or a greater restoration can suppress this for 24 hours. So I do like that a little bit because a remove curse or greater restoration only nullifying a curse for a little bit. I think is a fun way to have a resource drain on the game but not just have it be just simply waved away. So hopefully anybody that has any sticky fingers at all is turned off by the fact that Nib's being haunted. And even if they do, then guess what? Then they're going to have this gold and then they're going to get haunted. And then maybe they'll reconsider and bring the gold back. But the real important aspect of this thing is this cave with a whole bunch of gold is a great tool for your players to use that against another enemy in this game. Maybe at some point in the future, your players say, hey... How about this? I'll show you to a whole bunch of gold and you let us go by or whatever. Whatever it is that they negotiate with a villain because the League of Malevolence certainly has some characters that love gold. In addition to this curse, we also get some fun details. Nib talks about Loom Lurch and he talks about Granny Nightshade and the key on her back and how that there's many children that work under Granny Nightshades and she's obsessed with capturing Will of the Wild. Once you players have gotten a cool item and hopefully reciprocated the kindness and learned a little bit of the information here, your players are incentivized to go to Little Oak and meet up with the Getaway Gang and Will of the Wild. Now, I know some bleeding hearts out there are going to say, oh man, we should help Niv, and maybe your players can figure out a way to give Nib some reprieve. Maybe they cast some spells on Nib to allow him to leave the cave for a bit, and maybe Nib will be very appreciative of that. But at the end of the day, Nib definitely was a scumbag, <laughs> and he has to atone for that. But the thing is, is Nib can easily atone for what he's done, and maybe if your players force him to work off his debt, then he can be free of the curse. I think that is a great way to go about it. That's probably something that happens at the end of the campaign. Now, should your players go to Little Oak and meet up with the Getaway Gang and Will of the Wild, there they'll find a treant named Little Oak. But Little Oak isn't big because he's a treant. He's presumably pretty friggin' big. Not, you know, 50,000 stories tall as the picture might de <laughs> depict, but, you know, he's still gonna be pretty friggin' big. Now, here is where your players are gonna meet Will of the Wild and the Getaway Gang. So, Will of the Wild is, yes, a kid. But, more importantly, he's an Oni. <laughs> Will of the Wild is a actually a terrifying being. So the thing is, is Will has just all this awesome abilities. He's got, you know, the glaive attacks and the shape change and the cone of colds. You know, the usual Oni stuff. But he's a kid through and through, through his actions, in the fact that he is just uh, erratic. He doesn't really think things through. And he's just living in the moment. Now, Will's whole objective here is he wants to free all the kids from Loom Lurch. But the thing is, is his plans aren't the best, and thus his plans are probably not going to be able to free any kids. And if he ever does get captured by the CAG, then he's going to try and escape. Now, the interesting thing here is, why isn't Oni a good person here? It's because Scabbath the Nightshade placed a curse on him, and now he strives to be good. He is now chaotic good. And the odd thing is, is if your players, for some strange reason, cast a spell that ends a curse on Will, it regains its evil alignment and attacks whoever is responsible for lifting the curse, shouting, how could you, as it fights the death. That is a pretty grim take on this. I can definitely see the Will of the Wild aspect of this adventure being very upbeat and lighthearted, but that it can definitely take a Grimm's fairy tale twist where your players try and help out this person they think is cursed, but in reality the curse was a good thing and now they fight to the death. So it really just comes down to how perceptive your players are to these things and how far are they willing to go to try and help other people. Another large aspect of this is when your players arrive to Little Oak, there they'll meet a displacer piece named Star. And if your players met with Durlogren all the way back in the Witchlight Carnival, they will know that this is the missing cub. And now your players will have a quest to bring Star back to the Witchlight Carnival 
and Star definitely wants that. In addition to those two, we also get some fun information on the other Getaway Gang members, and these three are just other kids who have been presumably kids for a while, and are now free of the hag's clutches. In addition, in addition to not only the getaway gang, we also get Squirt the Oil Can, who is going to be the guide from Thither to Yawn. Squirt has led a hedonistic life where it basically lost all of its oil and now it wants more oil. And when you know it, just so conveniently, there is some oil to be retrieved at Loom Lurch because there is a whole bunch of boggles and boggles secrete oil. So the best thing to do with this little oak portion is to give your players some reprieve if they've had some harrowing encounters elsewhere and just have it be a fun moment where they can sit, relax, and talk to these people, get some more information about what's going on. And once they do, they'll learn about the child sweatshop essentially at Loom Lurch and they'll discover that Thither is slowly being corrupted, and it's not a fun time. And most important of all is there is going to be a plan to try and free some of the kids. So Will has got a big old plan in store, but the thing is, is the plan is not too great. There's going to be an approach, a distraction, and escape. But the thing is, there's a whole bunch of X factors your players don't know about, and the plan is sketchy, and if your players don't have any other better plan, then it's probably not going to work. But hey, we'll get to that later on. The important thing to discuss here, though, is your players will be told about the Wayward Pool. And they'll be told to meet with a unicorn, and this unicorn can be a great ally. So your players will be told to go to the Wayward Pool, but when they go to the Wayward Pool, the only way they can get there is if they themselves look like a unicorn. It just so happens that the group has a unicorn costume at hand, which can fit two adults. But, more importantly is, is some groups will either have some illusion magic they can use, or maybe they'll just get creative and slap some horns on themselves and dress themselves up as unicorns, and they can make their way there. Very interesting about the costume is, if you have the unicorn horn here, then the real unicorn horn is part of the costume. The kids just simply had it and they didn't know what they had. Which will be very interesting and kind of macabre, really. If your players have the real unicorn horn and they have that as part of their costume and go to meet the unicorn, then you should definitely factor that into the roleplay because that'll definitely be this weird thing of, hey, that's my maid's uh, horn, you know, what are you doing? So when it comes to Little Oak, it should be very painfully obvious that your players should be doing the right thing and helping these kids out. But there is the possibility that your players are blinded by the rewards offered by the hag to capture Will of the Wild. Here's the thing. In the land of Prismere, you cannot harm kids. If you do harm kids, then they flat out just disappear. They snap out of existence and they go somewhere else. Where that somewhere else is, it's not explicitly stated, but it's somewhere safe. So the getaway gang, you know, they can't be harmed, but Will is not a kid. Will is an Oni. So hopefully your players don't come in and start trying to knock out people or whatever. But if they do, if they knock out any of the kids, then the kids disappear. But if they try and knock out Will of the Wild, he's not going to disappear. And if your players catch on to that, they may be thinking to themselves, what the heck is going on? If your players don't use Lethal Force, though, to capture Will, if they simply just try and bind him or whatever and bring him there, then what's going to happen? Little Oak is going to strike back. Little Oak, being this treant, is going to uproot and just start laying the smack down. But the thing is, is a group might reasonably be able to capture Will real quickly and run away because maybe they'll figure out a way to slow this tree down. Funnily enough, trees are actually pretty quick. They have a speed of 30 feet and they can animate trees and they can hurl rocks and stuff. But once again, your players may get creative and maybe they'll just light Little Oak on fire because they have vulnerability to fire. You know, your players, if your players are monsters, then they can totally get away with this. But hopefully you don't have that. Hopefully your players either stick on board. One thing I do know that some groups are going to try and do is they'll say, Hey, Will, how about we feign that we capture you? We'll bring you to Loom Lurch. And while the hag is distracted, capturing you and taking you to wherever she is, then we're going to help out the other kids and then we're going to free you as well. I think Will would probably be down for that. I think Will is probably crazy enough to believe that if the players are trusting enough, if the characters are willing to show how loyal they are because maybe these characters are working for the hag in his eyes, you don't know. Whatever plans that may come about it, just make sure that it's erratic and fun because that's the kind of guy Will is.
Now, once your player has been told that there is a friendly unicorn in this land and they can try to get the unicorn's assistance, then they can make their way over to the Wayward Pool. But the interesting thing is, if they go to the Wayward Pool, but they do not have some sort of unicorn disguise, then the unicorn's not going to appear. So your players need to disguise themselves as unicorns, make their way there, light the brazier, and then boom, they're good to go. But here's the interesting aspect of this. Your players are not alone, as unfortunately the League of Malevolence has caught wind that there's a unicorn here, and the wizard Kellogg has sent the assassin Zorak to get the unicorn horn. The unicorn in question, a one Lamorna, is affecting the region with the usual unicorn stuff of non-magical flames are extinguished and beast and fae have an advantage on stealth and any creature that bays in the lake for one minute can choose to end one level of exhaustion affecting it or end one curse affecting it. Pretty cool. Alternatively, the creature can end its attunement to one cursed magical item, so if your players for some reason have a cursed item at this point, then maybe this is the best way to get rid of it. Now, your players have to go all the way to the islet there and light the brazier, and then a unicorn will appear. So, the thing is, is, do I think that your players need to swim all the way out to this island to do that? I certainly don't think so. I think you could just have your players just show up to the edge and maybe someone can shoot a little firebolt at it or maybe, you know, maybe the islet's actually not terribly far away. It's not 250 feet away. It could be just right there and your players can just walk into the shore because I know some people may get cautious of the water or whatever. Or maybe you make that an aspect of it where your players are absolutely deathly afraid of the water. One minute after the brazier is lit, then Lamorna will appear in the fine mist and you can totally show them that art piece which totally looks epic. And you can begin to describe how Lamorna talks to them telepathically. Lamorna will give out some excellent details on what's going on in the land, about how Zybilna ruled a lot better, and how these evil hags have ruined everything, and how Lamorna's mate Eladon's horn was stolen. You can have this great back and forth, and you can definitely have Lamorna be on edge because Lamorna doesn't know who these people are, and maybe they are agents of the hag. And if your players do anything at all, they brandish a weapon or they look like they're about to cast a spell, Lamorna is going to dip. Lamorna is going to plead with the characters to free the land of these evil hags and get Zybilna back. And at the same time, she's also going to tell them that there is someone who can guide them to the Palace of Heart's Desire, who is Amador, the dandelion, who is found in Yawn. And also some juicy details they will learn is that... Normally, people could only go to the Palace of Arts Desire if they had an invitation, but the hags can't really enforce that. They also learn about a library on the second floor which has amazing treasure tomes, and also very importantly is the fact that the Jabberwock is around there. Pretty gnarly stuff. So at some point during these conversations, Zorok is going to attack because he wants that unicorn horn, and he's probably correct in assuming that this is one of his best chances while the unicorn is distracted. So the thing is, is while Zorok is most likely going to get an attack on the unicorn because he will have the initiative because everyone else is probably going to be surprised. The thing is, is Zorok has no actual way of killing the unicorn in one go because while Zorok does have some strong abilities here, Zorok is not strong enough to kill a unicorn in a single turn. So that's perfectly fine, even if he does get a crit, it's still only going to be not terribly that much damage. Basically, he's just working with D4s the whole time. So even after one turn, your players can see that Zorak does a bit of damage, and then the Unicorn on the first turn is going to teleport away. Now here comes the interesting bit. Your players watch as Zorak is just disgruntled, and he says, I didn't know Unicorns could do that. And then we have this weird standoff where your players were just talking to this unicorn, and now there's the person who just attacked the unicorn, what do your players do? Do your players just immediately attack Zorak? Do your players negotiate with Zorak? Maybe your players try to befriend Zorak. There is a lot of ways your players are going to approach this. My group in particular, they actually ended up getting Zorak to work with them because they said, hey, we're going to help you out. We know where the other unicorn horn is, so you come with us and then we'll give you that information. So there's definitely a lot of ways you players are going to approach this and you're just going to have to know what's going on. Zorak isn't the dumbest person around. If your players do put out an all-out assault, then Zorak is going to run away because he's probably going to be outnumbered. 
But the thing is, is Zorak is somewhat strong on his own, and if your players do have a loss of resources at this current moment in time, maybe Zorak can smell the weakness in the air and strike back. But more than likely, Zorak would try and run away. If your players kill Zorak, then Zorak's out of the picture and the story, and you don't have to worry about that for the remainder of the adventure. If your players capture Zorak, then you do have to get into the instance of, okay, what if your players try and get the information out of Zorak? Zorak is not willing to divulge information, but if he has a charm person or other similar effect placed upon him, then you can learn a lot of juicy details about what's going on at the Palace of Arts Desires and with League of Malevolence, and a whole bunch of just great information. Your players will be wondering, okay, first off, we have to deal with these hags, but now we've got to deal with this whole other faction of evil people? That sucks. And then, of course, we get into the negotiation aspect of it. Zorak wants the horn. He needs the horn because he's been instructed to get it. But the thing is, is that there's two horns in this world. One which is wherever you put it, and one that is right here. Zorak knows for certain that there's a unicorn horn right here, and then he's going to basically just stay here until he can get it. But your players, just like my players, might say, hey, we know where the other unicorn horn is. In which case, Zorak is going to comply because he sees this aspect of this unicorn and says, oh great, this is going to be impossible to get. So he is probably going to be willing to work with the party. He's not going to do it delightfully. He's going to do it very begrudgingly. But he will do it. He will work the party and he can join the massive amount of NPCs that are accompanying the party. But the thing is, is that there needs to be some sort of agreement. Zorak's not going to just walk off and say, oh yeah, this is going to be easy peasy. I'll just work with you guys and you're totally going to keep to your promise. No, Zorak is going to need some collateral. And that collateral can come in the form of a magical item. And what I did in my case is Zorak took one of the NPCs and says, Hey, I'm going to take your friend here. I'm going to hide them in the woods somewhere. And if you do not keep good on your promise, then your friend's dead. I think that's perfectly in line with what Zorak would do. Zorak can be a really interesting companion for the party because he's totally evil and totally mean and doing terrible things. But your players may not want to get on their bad side. Maybe they don't want to pick a fight with the League of Malevolence. But the interesting thing is, if Zorak is with the party for a long time, and your players get into meetings with any of the Valor's Call members, then there's an interesting twist, because then it's like, oh, hey, I don't like you, you don't like me. And then you get into this weird confrontation of, oh, great, now what do we do here? So definitely work with what your players are giving you, if they attack Zorak, if they negotiate with Zorak, or, as mentioned before, and was also listed here, your players may try and bribe Zorak and say, hey, we can guide you to a place that has a whole bunch of gold, and we can give you all the gold that you want, here you go. And they can lead Zorak to Nib's cave, Zorak steals a whole bunch of gold, Zorak gets cursed, and then Zorak is pretty much out of the picture. Now, right here at the very bottom of the Wayward Pool, we get development. Lamorta's maid, Eladon, has been transformed into the flying rock horse that Granny Nightshade rides as a mount. If the spell on Eladon is broken and he is reunited with Lamorna, she rewards each character with a charm of heroism. Very powerful stuff. This charm is essentially activating a ability that gives you 10 temp HP and gives you the effect of bless for an hour, which is pretty freaking cool, and it's also no concentration. So, uh, pretty cool stuff. Now, what does it take to get Eladon freed of the terrible transformation? We'll be looking at that when we get to the Granny Nightshade episode. And the last for this video, we are going to touch up on a little bit of Loom Lurch. Your players, when they arrive to Loom Lurch, they'll see this massive tree, and they'll actually see that there is, outside of this location, a market. And that's the thing that we're going to be talking about here, is this market. Here in Area 2, just outside of the Loom Lurch itself, your players are going to see a market which is owned by a whole bunch of goblins. And when your players approach, they'll see that these goblins are basically just, you know, selling stuff. And most important of all that stuff is candy. The interesting thing though is that one goblin in particular sticks out. Chucklehead. And the reason this goblin sticks out is because look at that head. That ain't no regular goblin head. Chucklehead has a pretty interesting story here about having a toffee apple head and how a maggot has crawled into his brain and started eating it. And because this maggot is eating into his head, it's given him a different disposition on life. Chucklehead is a lot more sympathetic to the plight of others, but at the same time is also crazy because he thinks that the maggot speaks to him and unfortunately is not having a great time. What's really sad and macabre about this is the maggot in the goblet's head will kill him in 30 days unless he receives the benefit of magic that cures a disease. The magic slays the maggot, but also reverts Chucklehead's alignment to neutral evil. 
pretty interesting. Also here is that Chucklehead is protective of Mishka, who is one of the kids in Loom Lurch, but we'll be getting into that in the next video. The cool thing here is that there's a whole bunch of stalls, and these stalls sell candy, and if your players eat these candies, then they'll get some awesome rewards. Now, like all other things in the land of Prismere, you can't buy these things with gold, you have to buy them with trinkets, and hopefully your players have done some things to earn them some trinkets, whether they got them from somewhere else, or they work hard for them, you know, they barter them, whatever it is that they do. They can use these trinkets to buy these candies, and these candies actually have some fun benefits here. Your footfalls emit musical notes that can be heard out to a range of 30 feet. That's a bad one. But then at the same time, we also get some fun ones like you grow as though by the enlarged effect by the large reduce spell. That's actually a good one. Another fun one is fireflies are drawn to you and form a persistent cloud around you, shedding a bright light of five foot and five dim. So some of these are good. I think the shrink one is also really good as well. So it really comes down to what your players are trying to do. Some of these are just for fun and gag. Some of them actually have mechanical benefits. The polymorph one actually... Upon inspection, it is probably a bad one because being a polymorph creature does mean that you are as intelligent as that creature, and if you're a butterfly, you are not intelligent at all. But those things are pretty fun, and they can definitely be useful throughout the adventure, whether your players eat them, or also importantly is your players could feed these to other creatures, and the other creatures could have some terrible things happen to them. And also, also is if your players stockpile a bunch of these candies, then they can discover that if you eat more than three, you have to make a DC 11 constitution saving throw or become poisoned for eight hours. I definitely suspect that if your players get a whole bunch of these candies and force feed it to some monster at some point in the adventure, whether they force them to eat it or more importantly trick them into eating it, then having a monster become poisoned for eight hours is a huge benefit. And I think that could be a totally fun thing. In the next video, we'll be diving into Loom Lurch and learning all about Granny Nightshade. There is a lot of good elements going on here. The environment's so beautiful and the setups can just be absolutely phenomenal. It really comes down to how your players approach this, but I promise you whatever way they do approach it, they're going to be in for a great time. So that's going to do it from the name locations of the Land of Thither. Tell me, do you think that these name locations are better than the other ones? Or do you think that some of the other places have more going on? How do you like the introduction of Zorok into the adventure? Do you think that the League of Malevolence should be more out and about in the land of Prismere? Or do you think it makes sense that they all just stay at the Palace of Heart's Desire? And how are your players going to approach Will of the Wild? Are they going to go alongside his terrible plans? Or are they going to go their own way? Go ahead and tell me those things because I would love to hear it. But that's going to do it for me. Thank you for watching. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my amazing patrons. You guys are absolutely incredible. Thank you so very much. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.